your names and then you can introduce yourselves and remind us where you're coming in from. Great. Uh, and uh, Heather, well, I guess you're the first on my list. I'm Heather Mahano, attending from Lansing, Michigan. Wonderful, Jesse. Um, I am not actually a member of the commission, but I am attending virtually from East Lansing, uh, Michigan, Jesse Gregg, Council Liaison. Great. Uh, Barbara? Um, Barbara Borges from East, zooming in from East Lansing, Michigan. Wonderful. Abby? Abby Taikaki, Arts Commissioner, zooming in from East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, Allie? Allie Ciardo, zooming in from East Lansing, Michigan. And I'm still having some audio issues, so I might be jumping out just to try to fix that. Absolutely. Thank you for letting us know. Uh, Karen. Karen Jennings, zooming in from East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, ben. Hey, everybody. Ben Van Dyke, zooming from uh, East Lansing, Michigan. Wonderful. And Austin? Austin Pabian, zooming in from East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, and then Gabby. Unless I take Gabby. Hi, Gabby you? Kendig, zooming in from East Lansing, Michigan. Wonderful, Wendy. Oh, I just muted myself, sorry. Uh, Wendy Sylvester Rowan, zooming in from East Lansing. Excellent, I think that I hit everyone but Liam, uh, who is our host tonight. Um, all right, thank you so much. Um, has everyone had a chance to read uh, and uh, has anyone had a chance to read the agenda or the agenda for tonight? Hopefully, okay, taking a quick look. Um, wonderful. And um, do we have a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved, uh, Laura. Uh, thank you so much, Ben. Uh, does anyone second? A second, Wendy Celeste Roy. Thank you. All right, uh, all in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, Laura. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. We'll jump in for a discussion in that section um, of the motion. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, let me just um, mention that I, I wanted to bring something up. I don't, I'm looking at the agenda. Um, there's something to bring to all of your attention. And I'm wondering, um, I, would, I would ask for just five short minutes. Uh, sure. And it uh, would require a vote or, or, or maybe just short discussion, but um, I'm not seeing on the agenda where that would be best placed? So the best place uh, is under reports uh, and you can report as a commissioner at any time um, with anything that you would like to bring to the table. So if it's not something that requires a formal vote, uh, then that might be the best uh, place to, uh, to make your uh, statement. Great, thanks for teaching me on the process. Okay. Um, then no need for amendment. Excellent. Um, and that just is a, is a great rule of thumb for everyone to know. So you all always have a chance to, to speak and bring things forward. If you want us to look at something ahead of time, it's always best to send it to Heather um, or myself. Um, wonderful. Any other uh, additions, changes, amendments to the agenda? All right. All in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 I'm going to try to shuffle through all the screens real quick. Um, thank you, <laughs> Liam. Uh, any oppos anyone opposed? All right, so moved. Uh, and then has everyone had a chance to read the minutes from February 18th? Yes? All right, is there a motion to approve the minutes? I, Karen Jennings, move to approve the minutes as written. Thank you so much. Uh, does anyone second? I, Ali Ciardo, second. Thank you. Um, any questions, comments, adjustments? Wonderful. Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, communications from citizens. Um, I don't know if we had anyone waiting in the room, <coughs> if you will. Um, I don't- There is no one waiting except for Elaine and Monica. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, and then I don't believe we have any written communication unless something's popped up in the last hour. No written communications. Great, um, thank you. So I'm gonna move on to reports. Um, 
as chairperson, I just want to say hello. I'm excited to see all of the, the awesome things happening downtown. I hope the farmer's market uh, or the open market uh, went well. I heard a lot of people excited about grabbing uh, goodies and uh, et cetera. So I also want to thank Wendy um, and all of you uh, for taking the reins while I was nursing a migraine um, under the covers. <laughs> so I'm sorry I missed us last meeting and I really appreciate um, y'all uh, going forward. Uh, Wendy, was there anything that you wanted to add? I don't think so. Yeah. Thank cool. you. Um, Jesse, as our council liaison, did you have anything to add to this meeting? Um, yeah, I can just kind of update you guys on one new thing. Well, not new. I did mention it in the email, the group email. So we did have at our discussion meeting last Tuesday, we had um, our first kind of opening chat with the art space people about the possibility of inviting them in to do a feasible feasibility study. Um, it's a it's a weird format for a development and it's you know so it follows it's not following kind of our standard development format and it requires a fairly decent investment from us up front which is you know not how we usually approach development needs lancing um, so you know I'm not sure how it's going to play when it comes back to council um, just to to kind of I'll try not to belabor things that I might have already talked to you guys about but this is it's a nonprofit developer they're based out of the Twin Cities and they really focus on uh, so all of their all of their developments are income qualified um, and they're but they're also focused on um, creative talent so you don't have to make your living primarily through your art but you have to be engaged in creative sector in some way in order to qualify to live in these apartments um, and I, you know, I went to art school in St. Paul. I went to um, school at Hamlin University and one of my classmates actually moved into one of their lofts post-graduation. So I've kind of, they've been on my radar as an interesting, interesting form of business um, for about 20 years now, kind of following the different things that they've done. They also have, they've recently started a kind of um, parallel nonprofit track um, called, I think it's called Art Up which is kind of like taking the startup model um, and applying it towards creative entrepreneurs as opposed to, you know, tech sector entrepreneurs, which is where that sort of stuff is usually done, which is again, something that I'm very interested in, you know, as a, as a council member and as a, a citizen East Lansing. So I would really like to see us move forward with this. I don't know um, if we can really convince the rest of the council that $30,000 speculatively is worth our investment to, um, to just kind of give them the opportunity to feel out the market, right? You know, so it's um, it's it. We'll see how how far we progress with this. Um, Jesse, are they actually week. voting next week? Are I don't think it's next week. I think it'll be a little bit longer before it comes oh. back. Um, so one of the things that came up, um, you know, because the thirty grand is not no money, right? It's it's a big, it's a big chunk. Um, in terms of municipal finance, it's not. A very big chunk. We spend thirty thousand dollars on a lot of things that are fairly incidental. It's just a little unusual to be asked to speculate on somebody else's possibility of developing in our in our you know in our city. Um, so we'll see. Um, but I think one of the things that was brought up at the council on Tuesday was the idea of going and finding some other partners to kind of offset that cost. So I think they're going to go back to the DBA and they're going to ask them if they can dedicate any amount of money towards that total. Um, I think that we're, we'll be looking at this group's budget to see if there's anything left that we could possibly um, donate from any little funds that we have left over, which I don't really think we do. So, <laughs> you know, but gotta look. Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now is seeing if there's some way that we can offset that cost so that the full 30,000 isn't coming out of the general fund budget. And then they'll come in and they'll do their kind of um, outreach process where they engage possible community partners, different foundations, different philanthropic things. They'll look at all of the tax credits that are available for um, low income housing and just basically see if their model will work in our community. So. Um, that's the other part of it is we, you know, we give them the money to do their study and then there's not really a guarantee at the end that they will be like, yes. So, you know, I don't know. It's a, it's a weird system, but I do think it's a very good opportunity for us to bring slightly more conscious type of development into our city. 
I guess the thing that gets me on it is if we let economics dictate what gets built where, then we're just going to have nothing but student apartment buildings because that's the guaranteed paycheck in East Lansing. So if we're going to try to move that needle, then we really do have to actually start putting some very deliberate intention behind it um, in terms of, you know, our zoning codes and our things, but also in recruiting specific types of people to come and build specific types of things, which is what this is. So anyway, interesting process. Um, their presentation is attached to last Tuesday's um, agenda. If you wanted to go look through their slide presentation, um, I just, I mean, I'd encourage you to look into them as a, as a nonprofit. They're just kind of a fascinating group of people that's done a lot of really interesting development basically all over the nation, a lot in Minnesota, but they've, I think they're in like 26 states now. So, um, you know, it's kind of cool. Let's see what else is coming through that's possibly related to you guys. Yeah. In regards to art space, is, are there yeah. any stats as to like, is there any, any, um, would they come, you know, have, do they do any groundwork before they come to say like, listen, we think this is a pretty good opportunity. It's not like they're going to take the 30,000 and run and be like, mm, sorry, right. it didn't work. Right. Um, um, you know, do yeah. they, or are there any stats as to how many cities they go to and say no dice or? He brought up, because that was something that council member Bacon brought up in the discussion was he was saying like, well, this, you know, seems like maybe it's a foregone conclusion. We give you money and you're like, oh, guess what? We found out it will work, you know, and like you get 30 grand in your pocket and then you like skip down the road. And they brought up a couple of instances where they did find that the community just wouldn't support the type of development they're talking about. Um, so, you know, and then the community is out 30 grand, which is not insubstantial. So, um, you know, yeah. Yeah. definitely have to consider that as part of the thought process. Um, that feasibility study, that really is where they go and kind of do that tree shaking and um, engage the community in terms of seeing if there is, you know, first of all, if there's a market for that type of unit, if there's enough um, creative economy people who are looking for, <laughs> for places to live in East Lansing that they could actually fill their unit. Some of the things that they do also have, you know, retail and community components to them too, which I'm, you know, as a creative sector retailer, I'm pretty interested in incubation of businesses that are not necessarily like glamorous tech company incubation style um, things. I'd, I'd love to bring some more kind of uh, community identifying type businesses into our downtown. Um, so the possibility of having like rent controlled retail space is very exciting to me as a part of this process. Um, so, you know, feeling out if there's a market for that. Um, but then I think also a big part of what they're doing in that feasibility step is just identifying possible philanthropic partners to offset the cost of this kind of stuff. So um, talking to community foundation, talking to, you know, people who have given to different <laughs> causes in the past and just make, you know, seeing if there's enough um, possible partners to fill out that part of their funding model. So, um, you know, always fun to ask people for money. So does that, did that get to the root of your question, Wendy? Sorry. Yeah, it did. I mean, I've got a million other questions, but I just <laughs> love to see that happen. And yeah. Uh, Know, I just wonder how, I mean, is there any, and so is there anything else that needs to be done from our standpoint? And I think not from, not from our standpoint, I think it's pretty clear that the percent for art money is dedicated for physical artwork. I don't think we can get around that. Um, and I'm not really sure what's left in the budget in terms of like anything from the um, small grants, if there's anything left there that might potentially be possible to, to shift, shift over to something like this. But um I guess if you, you know, um, if, if you do, if you do think it's a good idea, <laughs> you know, you could kind of, uh, I think we did get a letter from Barb. I saw your, your email come through, Barb. I appreciated that. Um, but I mean, also if you have questions too, we can look into it and ask them more questions too, before it comes back to council. Allie. Yeah, I have a quick question. Has there been any discussion about the fact that I know you talked about like student renting to students and I don't know if this is like for better or worse, but um, has there been discussion about the fact that students sometimes are artists and then is that like 
Would yeah, they... I'm not sure how that would work. So like in other low income qualified um, developments, the person who is the primary tenant has to not be a dependent of somebody else. And so that takes a lot of students out of the mix, but not necessarily all of them. Um, so I don't think that I don't think that this would be a necessarily anti student development like I know my the one friend I know who did move into one of their lofts it was after graduation that he moved into it so I'm not sure if that was part of his dependent status or what but um, yeah it, it would be income qualified not you know um, student status qualified so it is quite possible that some of them could go to students if they met the other criteria. Okay, which could still be a good mix. I'm just curious because you yeah. mentioned that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's like, uh, it's, it's very early on in the process, I guess. And there's this big kind of looming question mark of this $30,000 and whether it will be seen to be worth it. So, you know, I guess it, to me, it comes back to the question of, um, of just knowing that like development is economically based and that the people who are coming in to build these things are not necessarily doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. They're really doing it for their return on investment paycheck. And that if that's what we continue to do, then we will continue to see pretty much exactly what is being built. So, um, you know, if we're gonna try to move that, it's gonna require something kind of radical to shift it, Abby. Um, I apologize because I emailed you to be like, I'm totally going to be calling in and making comments and then I straight did not show up. Um, uh, but my question is, didn't, in the pricing that we received for the, um, for creating an art strategy for East Lansing, what, does anybody remember an estimate? Like what was the it estimate? Was the it was in the range of 30 grand. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, so we, we are I mean, going to walk, we, regardless, we walk away with an arts market study. We, some of what would be in that study would be part of it. Yeah. I mean, it, their study is really focused on whether their specific type of development will work. So some of that is definitely gathering demographic data about the creative community. And I think we would be able to benefit from some of that. Um, but it's not, it's not really the same thing as what we were asking for in terms of the RFP, but it's, you know, it would have some information that would be useful to us for, for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, Any, anything else to talk about art space, I guess, before I make my plug for the downtown market? <laughs> I think it sounds exciting. Um, I think it's, I think I'm really excited about the thought of it. So yeah, I need a little more reading, but yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a weird it's a weird format for development for sure. But um, I think the possibility of it is very exciting because um, it's not going to happen organically. Um, yeah, and I guess the other thing for me to say is just to you know to keep uh, art. We've got a lot of stuff happening downtown in terms of art activation. We've got the elementary school kids art in the local businesses. I've got two of them between my, myself and Woven Art. We're hosting two different batches of them. One of which is my own child's darling contribution. Um, his his caveman drawing that he made. So anyway, you I should definitely like that. So I, I put that in my art. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and then I did get a follow up from one of the vendors from the downtown market and they said that last, the first two markets were very good for them and that the last one was a little bit less um, well attended. So um, if you don't mind getting the word out about that, it's, you know, possibly the weather's warming up, possibly the novelty is worn off, but we, we would like to keep seeing those vendors definitely, you know, feeling that it was worth their time to show up. Um, so, and I know that, um, I know our economic development team's got some other fun stuff planned for that space. So just kind of keep your eye out. I think there's another, a new community um, art installation happening at the library. Um, I just heard about it yesterday at the library board meeting. So I haven't had a chance to go check it out, but the, um, the returning home, or I can't remember what it was, the one that's been up in the front of the library has just been replaced with a new one. So there's new, new interesting community art up at the library. Um, I think that's everything that I had to talk to you guys about unless you have any questions for me about stuff. 
Thank you. <laughs> and I'm home today, so I don't have to run. I'm going to stick with you guys for the whole meeting and hang out and probably be interrupted by my children, but you know, what else? Amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Uh, commissioners, uh, Ben, did you want to go ahead and share with us? Sure. Thanks, Laura. Of course. I appreciate it. Um, so I just wanted to run something past all of you um, in, in part to just gauge interest, but also um, um, get some advice. Uh, this came to me very recently. In fact, um, only is a matter of days I sat on it. Um, uh, it was brought to me by the associate provost uh, at MSU. And then um, I had a phone call about it uh, about an hour ago. So this is this is purely just like, let me throw this out there. Uh, let me get some feedback. Let's see what you think. Um, see if this is something we want to, you know, um, sink our teeth into. Um, and also, this is a, a little jumbled in my head because it's fresh. Um, and it's a, a, a not that complicated, but I'm going to make it complicated just because that's what I do. Um, it's a bad habit of mine. Um, so, <laughs> so let me try this. So... Michigan State, about two or three years ago, um, opened the Science Gallery. And just out of curiosity, how many of you are aware of the Science Gallery? Okay, good. So um, um, uh, six seconds on, on what the Science Gallery is. It is a um, started by Trinity College in Dublin, uh, sorry, Dublin, Ireland. And um, it is a, um, it's a serious gallery. Um, they opened up um, 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 sites, uh, brick and mortar galleries um, all over the world, including Mumbai and Paris, London, that type of thing. Um, long story short, Michigan State made a, made a bid for opening the first North American science gallery um, in Detroit as part of Michigan State's um, creative footprint. Um, they, they bought into the idea. It happened about two years ago. And just a year ago, we, uh, the university hired its second director, um, this person named uh, Devin Ackman, um, who is uh, a really interesting person. Uh, I spoke to Devin uh, just this afternoon, and he told me that um, they're doing the next upcoming exhibition that they're doing um, in, in, in part uh, in Detroit, but also here in, in on campus in East Lansing is um, around the idea of surveillance. They have an artist who has made a proposal um, as part of the exhibition. Uh, he's kind of a big shot uh, New York artist. Uh, and he, uh, is he is proposing to do a project about, um, about surveillance, but would like it not to be in a gallery. He wants it to be in the streets. And when I say in the streets, I don't mean like the street itself. Uh, but outside in public and not in the traditional um, venue of a gallery or museum. Uh, I have the proposal from the artist. I've read it. It's smart. Um, it's really good. Um, and he would like us to consider East Lansing to be the venue for his project. Uh, now, this gets interesting uh, because uh, uh, science gallery um, and all with all of its fame and fortune um, has made made a big impact in the city of Detroit uh, in part because the former provost of Michigan State Jun uh, really was interested in investing in, in in the city of Detroit and creating a lot of bridges between campus and, and, and that city our current provost is more interested in bringing the science gallery back to campus and bringing with it that visibility here um, back to our campus um, for some really good reasons. And, and, and so they're shifting gears to some extent. Um, now, this artist in all of his visibility and the science gallery with all of its vis visibility um, is, is, is profoundly in, important in the art world. Um, the thing is, uh, Michigan State has a lot to offer the gallery and it has a lot to offer artists in, 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 in so far as, um, 
insofar as resources, uh, the Broad, uh, the MSU Museum, um, other facilities on campus. Um, what the city of East Lansing has to offer uh, in exchange is the city itself as a venue. Now, this is not that unusual of an idea, and we've seen this work really well in Grand Rapids with Art Prize. One of the most fascinating things about Art Prize to me, in, it, in all of its um, issues and complexities uh, uh, and politics of that event, um, is that it was phenomenal in turning the city itself into a venue outside of the museum, outside of the gallery, outside of um, uh, kind of walls and, and floors and in, incorporated things like the river uh, and the streets and uh, the curbs and stop signs, you know? And, and I think that is, it was, a, it's, a, it's a phenomenal task. It was, it, was a, um, it was a brilliant move, right? And it worked. And a lot of that stuff in Grand Rapids that, that people were proposing and executing in the river is still there, right? And it really changed the landscape of that city. It's just extraordinary. Now we also got it. Also produced a, a lot of, um, you know, like, uh, <laughs> well, Jesus made out of pennies or whatever it was that won a quarter million dollars somehow. Abe you know. Lincoln, actually. Abe Lincoln, yeah, right. Not Jesus. Uh, Abe Lincoln. Thank you. Whoops. Uh, well, that's even worse then. So. That being said, I'm, I'm bringing this to you all to consider the, the possibility that, that East Lansing has a lot to offer um, that would be proportional to what Michigan State has to offer and proportional to what the Science Gallery is offering this artist as well. It's an extraordinary amount of visibility and it's a, it's, it's a brilliant project, but it is very unusual, right? So, um, I have the proposal. I, I'm I'm happy to share it with you all. Um, it is confidential, so I'm not I'm not sure how to share it without making it public, which is something I'm not allowed to do. You can um, you can share it with us. We just can't talk about it in a quorum, right? So we so, can all review it. Yeah. So if I shared it with you, do I email it? If I put it in the chat, a link, doesn't that make it public to the world? Yeah, you would you just email it to us and we can review it and maybe okay. individually when when we want to share our comments with you, we would share them straight to you and not reply all. Okay, yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, amongst this group, we can all look at it and it's, it's no problem as long as it doesn't become public, right? Sure. So I will do that and, and you can all, you know, give me some feedback. Um, um, what this person, Devin Ackman, the director of the museum, uh, or sorry, the science gallery is asking for is, is this from, from you all, I would like to take back to him whether or not this is interesting, uh, you're intrigued, thumbs up on a second conversation, or hell no, this is ridiculous, get out of here, you know, which is also fine, you know, um, you're entitled to that opinion, I understand, right? Um, so questions. So I had a question. Um, so I know that we, I think it's exciting. I would be interested in learning more. Um, I do know that, um, I was just wondering, is this a partnership that we're looking for with the Arts Commission? Is it looking for the Arts Commission to kind of serve as a into the city council liaising of this project or is this a partnership with uh, the Science Center and MSU and the Arts Commission specifically. Yeah, well, both actually, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot in it for us uh, in, in terms of visibility for the Arts Council, visibility for the city itself. Um, um, this, has, this has reach, it has impact. Heather, I just, since I just got an email from you a bit ago with the link, the Zoom link, I just replied to that and gave you I the link. That, yeah. <laughs> okay. Can you circulate that? Yes, I will do that. Thank you. Um, that will give you some context if you read through it. Um, the budget for this project is, is pretty um, minimal and also shared by three other entities. Sorry, 
I'm not used to having other people in this building. Um, Wendy, what am I missing? I gave I gave Wendy the 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 um, the preview of, of of this since. You know, I guess you know, Laura. To your question, is it a formal partnership? That's what I was asking Ben. I'm like, how is this a bad thing? I'm not, I'm missing what the negative would be. Why we wouldn't all sign on to this, right? Um, interestingly, and Ben, I don't think it, it would be a secret. The the guy Devin, who's in charge of this science gallery, is actually on the board of Art Space, which I thought was fascinating. Um, connecting dots, but I, you know, it's not. It's a to me, it's a win win. It's visibility. It's 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 partnerships, which I think you know uh, we've discussed in the past, and and Ben and I just discussed. I think a lot of times the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing, and if we don't, if we try and Utilize, you know, form partnerships between these organizations, it's, we're all the better for it because we've all got the same goal to live in a, a rich, you know, diverse, exciting place and, and make that our downtown. So to me, this is a win, win, win. I don't, I don't see what the negative is. It's only $3,000 uh, budget. And if there's three other entities and we might not even have to cough up, cough up any money. I mean, my God. So that was, that was my two bits. Yeah. Uh, any other questions before we have a chance to read the proposal? I'm excited. Definitely want to know. <laughs> um, uh, so why don't we do it this way? So we stay compliant. Um, Karen, did you have a question? Sorry, sorry. Well, I just want to say, I, I like the idea of bringing something edgy to downtown East Lansing. Yeah. I just think that is always a good thing for East Lansing. That's yes. good to hear, Karen. I really appreciate you saying that. Yeah, I, I'm the same. Yeah. And then Austin, did you have something? Oh, I was just going to thank Ben for bringing that to us. I think that's really interesting and could be a, a great uh, potential possibility for the area. Spice things up because things have gotten a bit like Groundhog Day around here. Agreed. Yeah. Let me, let me tell you one quick anecdote. When I first moved here to East Lansing, um, and now it's almost seven years ago, which feels a lot more like 70, one of the things I noticed first was walking around downtown East Lansing, especially down Grand River, kind of by uh, uh, Peanut Barrel, were these beautiful painted things that looked at first at first glance, like spilled paint or blood. Do you all know what I'm talking about? And then on a closer look, it's actually a really brilliant pattern um, with a lot of a lot of uh, uh, smart context and, and, and really brilliant thinking behind it. Um, and one of the first things I was introduced to when I moved to East Lansing was that project and thinking, oh man, that's so good to see. Like that's really unusual. It got me uh, at the bottom of my foot. I was walking down the road, and that type of impact um, is a is a is a is a is a, 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 um, a significantly different experience than it is to walk across the street, walk into yeah. the road, and 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 these shiny, perfect walls, and they're 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 well crafted, curated exhibitions, right? It's just it's just a different thing, and nobody's freaking doing it. Well, and, and Ben, that installation caused a lot of chatter in East Lansing and love it or hate it, people were talking about it and people really lined up on both sides. People right. loved it. I loved it. I loved people it. hated it. It was but in they talked about it. His name. Yeah, but I mean, his other artwork, mm -hmm. I, I believe, what's the other place that he did it? I want to say in New York City, I'm not sure. I mean, it was just phenomenal. That was, that was right here. And some people thought it looked right. like a murder scene. People got themselves bent out of shape, that it was on private property, that he painted. Kind of went, you know, he went off script a little bit there. But it was phenomenal. It's the one of the, you know, there's certain yeah. things that the Broad has done that has ha had a lasting impact that I think of. That is one of them for sure. And I feel like the way Ben's Absolutely. this next part, could, this next, you know, exhibition could be the same. Yeah. I mean, the best, yeah. my best experiences in, in seeing art, whether or not it's here or at the road or somewhere else in the world, is, is the work that hits me. And I think, mm, what? And my brain clicks in, right? 
And this is true for everybody. Um, and, and, and oftentimes I'll walk into a museum sometime and I'll see some paintings and I'm like, that's nice. I wonder if they have coffee here, right? And um, and when I saw and when I saw that stuff painted on the on the ground in East Lansing, I, you know, I had an entirely different experience. I don't know why that's not happening more. Yeah, and nobody ha and nobody has to like it, but everyone's talking about it, you know. Uh, yeah. I have a really quick question: Was there any talk about timing, or is that in the thing you would send? Huh. Yeah, Wendy hit me with that one too, and it's a good question. I'm not sure, Sorry, but it's soon. They're reviewing proposals and making decisions about which artists are going to participate in this particular exhibition. Um, and I think that exhibition opens mid to late summer. In fact, I could probably figure it out. Um, so it's 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 near future. Um, you know. Um, well, I think that as uh, Lynn's looking at those dates, just a reminder, Heather will send it out, um, but please respond only to Ben so that we're not um, violating uh, any conversations. And then once we know more, uh, once it looks likely, um, once we get the go ahead from the, uh, the center, we can open it up for, <laughs> uh, for public conversation so that, so that we're in compliance, but want to respect the process um, that, that we need to go to before that. Great. Um, uh, any other commissioners have anything to add? Any reports? Awesome. Uh, ben, maybe you could stick the dates in the chat. Um, yeah, September. Oh, uh, perfect. <laughs> so, you know, late summer, I guess. Back to school. I like it. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, staff report, Heather. Yes, I just have three quick things to share with you. Uh, first, Abby, I looked into your question about the budget, um, where we're charging the biotech captioning to, and um, the public art fund allows for 15% to be spent on administrative things. And in this case, we actually are only spending it on biotech no other administrative things are coming out. So it's definitely within the budget and an allowable expense. That was good to confirm. <laughs> um, and then I wanted to remind you all that the art festival is still taking donations and sponsorships. We have a few extra months to get that um, pulled together now because the festival is August 7th and 8th instead of in May. So I just wanted to throw that out there for you. Um, a few of you have already actually donated. No peer pressure here. I won't say names, but thank you. <laughs> um, and then we have nine submissions for our request for qualifications already. I got one just as the meeting was started. So um, nine, and I've talked to several artists who are interested, asking questions, making sure everything's in order. So um, we've had some really cool submissions. It's been fun to stroll through their resumes. So I think we're going to have a really awesome mural go up here. Did, did, did any knock your socks off? Um, a couple of them. I was like, whoa, this guy, this person, really? They want to do our mural? Wow. So, um, so great. Yeah, it was, it's, it's, it's been exciting to, to do this, <laughs> to be the first one with the eyes on them. It's been pretty cool. So look at us being a our awesome art hub. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> too cool. Yeah. So um oh and then one more thing. We uh the I haven't shared this with the Roadhouse Pub folks yet because it just happened this evening. Um, I'll share it with them shortly, but I got a quote to prep the greetings tour wall. It looks like that's going to be starting. They're actually going to start the mural around May 10th. Um, and I, Roadhouse Pub folks do know that. Um, but we need to prep the wall ahead of time. And I just got that quote. I think that we had talked in an earlier meeting about it being about $1,500. And it's actually going to be more like $3,500. So um, it's with we have the budget to spend it on that. We can't, this is just a part of the report at this point, but if it's something we want to talk about and vote on, I can put it on the next meeting agenda. We, we definitely still have time to discuss it and make the, make the choice. 
Is, um, is that our only choice? I mean, is that something you can get estimates for, or is that it's a done deal? That's that's no, nope, I can get I can get estimates. I I um I asked for a quote from somebody that the city has used in the past, so that I knew that we were it was somebody who had been the lower bidder at one point. So, um, I can definitely look for more quotes though if you would like I mean, me to. more than double is a little is a little shocking. Yeah. Huh. Thank you. Yeah, I think more quotes would be great. I do know, um, just working in theater, I know that prices for things like lumber is off the charts right now. Um, so I don't know if maybe uh, actual paint might be yeah. off the charts, but yeah, I would be interested to see. Yeah. Uh, if and the other, I think that we hadn't, um, we hadn't included a graffiti clear coat in our original estimate too. And I added that in. For the request so that could have been what put us over but um but I, i'll ask for more quotes from others um i think that would be great if they if if they all come back at um if they all come back at the same rate um then i think that it would be great to add that as an, a talking point um, okay i'll plan on it for april awesome. uh gabby is uh, grabbing a charger um, and i'll be right back so um, great. Uh, any other staff reporting? Nope, that's all I have. All right, so we uh, do not have any um, business agenda items for the uh, ordinance 1339 applications. Um, so let us move on uh, to uh, our next item 6.1. Uh, Monica Ramirez went to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, do we have uh, Monica in the the wing still? Oh, perfect. Hello and welcome. Oh, you're okay. muted. There you go. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, such a pleasure meeting you all. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. It's um. I mean, it's not what I wanted to discuss with you, but I do need to let you know that in with regards to the science gallery. The, the broad is kind of like their, their landlords right now. Uh, we have a, a representation of the science gallery right now inside of uh, the broad, this, this uh, satellite space that the broad runs on is Grand River uh, 565 to be specific. And so if you wanna see things that the uh, science gallery is actually doing right now, it's, it's already in East Lansing and it's, uh, I just visited again this last Sunday and they have um, their exhibition, but you can get a tour with a robot. And so there's like this robot that approaches you and there's a screen and there's a person on Zoom like us working from their home, but that person can give you the tour of the exhibition and engage with you. So they do, they do lovely things. And Devon is a great colleague and he's in many boards, I believe, including the American Alliance of Museums, which is the governing organization that sets the guidelines for all professional museums in the United States. So we have a terrific partner in him and a, fabulous leader in the arts. Um, so just wanted to say that that we have partnered with them and we are very pleased with that partnership. One of those partnerships is actually this Saturday and I gave uh, Heather like the link in case you wanna join us. Um, the Science Gallery approached us, the MSU Bro to organize uh, kind of like a series of events dealing with grief and mourning as we, many of us have gone through losses, we haven't had time to, to process and there will be this need for, um, for mental health uh, tools so that we can all kind of like process in the months to come. So this Saturday, we're going to host a panel that's free and open to the public. You just need to register. Heather has the link um, where we have four different uh, scholars that are experts in mourning, in mourning and grieving death rituals around the globe. So we will have a very prominent artist, Mary uh, Clark from, from Australia, and she works with Aboriginal communities. So she's gonna be joining us from her Sunday at eight o'clock in the morning for our Saturday panel at 6 p.m. Then we have another scholar who focuses, Ruth Tolson, she focuses on Singapore death rituals, but she also herself is the director of a funerary home. And she, her family has a 200 year tradition apparently on running funerary homes in the UK. We have another scholar that's going to be talking about uh, death rituals in Senegal and another scholar Rocio from MSU who will be talking about ancient death rituals and cycles of life from Peru. So anyway, those are the kind of 
cross-disciplinary transactional um, partnerships that um, the Science Gallery helps us kind of implement. So it's kind of exciting. So that to say, I'm the new uh, director for the MSU Broad Art Museum. Uh, I've been here for about eight months and have not been uh, yet able to explore the whole city. So I was just eavesdropping in your conversation and taking notes on have to go now to the library to check out that new art installation that's in, in front and, you know, go to Jesse's store, etc. But I wanted to kind of like share with you quickly what the, the vision that I bring to the museum. And I want to show you some um, images of a couple of exhibitions that are coming up now in the fall and then give you like a sense of what, what the idea for the museum is. And uh, the idea for, for the museum, a little bit of shift in our identity will be to actually make sure that we have something for everyone at all given times. We are very well known uh, as um, leaders in the field of contemporary art. And that is kind of like a spot that every single contemporary museum would like to have. So we are keen on maintaining that and furthering the, that specialized field forward. But we also want to acknowledge that we are in East Lansing and that we are the only contemporary art museum free to the public in a 60 mile radius and that we have to keenly serve our immediate communities. So what we will be doing at the museum is a, once, a, a, once a year, we will be dedicating at least half of the museum to exploring social justice issues that are of concern to our immediate communities. And so we will start this fall with an exhibition on mass incarceration in the United States. And uh, thank you, um, Liam, for... Um, so there's two exhibitions coming up uh, on mass incarcerations at the Broad this fall. And they will, going back a little bit with, to the Science Gallery, they will be in tandem with the Science Gallery developing uh, their project on surveillance, right? Which is really a really nice different point of access to how certain communities uh, don't get the the luxury of having a second chance in life, for example. So per sister, uh, Voices of Incarcerated Women of America actually was an exhibition I worked at in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. And Louisiana is considered the prison capital of the world. The United States is considered the, co the country, the developed country that incarcerates more of its population than the, all the NATO countries together. The United States incarcerates more folks. So we are known for incarcerating our own communities and Louisiana in particular, is the one that incarcerates the most. So we, we worked with women, formerly incarcerated women, we interviewed them and we gave their stories to 30 artists in the community and they kind of like returned this fabulous uh, exhibition for us. We humanized a lot of the data that we had from research done in our campus community in Louisiana. And it was so successful that for example, the juvenile justice court sent all their staff, including parole and probation officers to get an empathy and compassion training in this exhibition to understand who the mothers of some of the uh, youth were that they were, pro you know, um, and, and many of them were incarcerated and to kind of like understand different models of families, for example. So uh, bringing this exhibition from Louisiana, we knew that the first question was going to be, well, what about Michigan? So we've partnered with about 10 or 15 local organizations, Safe and Justice uh, Michigan, Center for Justice in Detroit, Youth Arts Alliance, um, um, five faculty, more than five faculty from family development and youth um, development. In any case, 45 folks were in our last meeting, the, the College of Music, et cetera, to uh, um, ARCA, the residential college in the College of Arts and Letters and WAKR, for example, are also our partners. So um, one important partner is PCAP, um, the Prison Arts Creative Program run at University of Michigan. They have a program where they actually bring materials into the prison system to work with incarcerated folks. And they've been running their program for 15 years, very successfully. I knew about them when I was in Louisiana. So what we're doing is uh, curator Stephen Bridges has made a selection of the highlights of that program. And it's kind of like the bulk of the free um, your mind art and incarceration in Michigan. But we're also working with Professor Guillermo Galindo, who works with youth incarcerated youth, and they do a lot of uh, spoken word performance and zines. We'll incorporate that as well. We have two other projects in other galleries in the museum that deal with isolation and confinement stories from isolation uh, with a group called Zealous. And also 
with the Youth Arts Alliance, where, where hopefully we're going to be able to show some uh, art ex exercises they're doing of envisioning with, with youth that is aging out of the foster care system and the exercise with the youth alliances for them to actually create some scale models, some spaces that they would see inhabiting themselves based on their the identities that they're developing. So it's kind of like an identity reaffirmation exercise. So that that's kind of um, where I think the museum, the MSU Broad has yet to explore these kind of exhibitions where the subject matter are issues of concern in our communities and how we can leverage uh, faculty expertise and off-campus communities expertise into this kind of like um, consortium of curators that help us make sure that the folks in the exhibitions are well represented, right? And that we are facilitating self-representation of directly impacted communities. So that's coming up now in the fall. So I hope you'll come and visit the exhibition. Can we see the next slide? The two exhibitions. This is uh, January to the whole year of 2022 is going to be the anniversary of the Broad. And yes, to many of your surprise, it's going to be 10 years since it was first built. And every time I say I'm organizing the 10th anniversary, everybody, <laughs> everybody's in shock. But um, the idea is that uh, we will highlight a lot of our collections and we are going to be doing about four different exhibitions the first semester of the year and we're going to be working with semesters to facilitate faculty and students and give the community a little bit more time to visit these kind of exhibitions and um, we're going to be focusing on our collections and looking at four different aspects of our collection you know on art history kind of like timeline. Um, we're gonna be looking at the contributions of MSU faculty and, and artists in the region. And we're also going to be discussing what are the gaps that we have in our collection and, and look critically at the practice of collecting, you know, and who collects and why, and who gets collected and why. So that's gonna be the first semester. And within that same semester, we're actually excited to to be featuring for the first time ever in the world, uh, an exhibition on Frida Kahlo, but not so much. We will have about 10 or 15 original artworks, but um, we're gonna be revealing for the first time to the world her clinical files when she was in a hospital stay in the 1950s. And this is the first time that these files have ever been seen. And so we can see what she had for breakfast, which was like orange juice and sugar and insulin, for example. There's a couple of files that show when she was actually getting her leg um, amputated, her right leg. So the point is to actually show a Frida Kahlo that was, you know, a human that was going through a lot. And nevertheless, she persisted and she single-handedly from the bed of her hospital, re, you know, shaped the art world of the 20th century. You can still ask anyone, you know, tell me who is a, a woman artist? Who do you know that's a woman artist? And Frida Kahlo uh, will come first and people then struggle to mention a second one actually. And so um, it's gonna be a very intimate exhibition with a lot of archives. And we are doing it in partnership with Frida Kahlo's great grand niece, which is how she got to, to get these clinical files because she demonstrated and this is a four year process. She demonstrated that she was a family member. Family members do have access to their, to their family files. And so she finally, she was able to get them and we've helped her process and how do we turn them into an exhibition? So that's going to be January to May on 2022. Can we see the next slide? We're going to do a massive Sahadid retrospective in the fall. The whole museum is going to be dedicated. Well, we're gonna carve the other one gallery space for Flint's family. But what we wanna do is make sure that through this exhibition and through diverse points of access for different audiences, that we explain why this building is so important and hopefully to elicit that sense of pride that I think we all should have in East Lansing of having this tremendous masterpiece, you know, in our own center of our own town. So we wanna make sure that a lot of the explanations match the K-12 curricula. We're already working on that and we're hoping to be able to publish a free coloring book that will actually explain the building based on this curricula, right? That for, um, they need to, children at that age need to um, know what, uh, have storytelling skills, know what pattern, color, scale, volume, all of that can be explained through the building. And we will also carve a gallery space to show Latoya Ruby Fraser, who has been living in Flint. Uh, she's a Chicago-based artist, but she's, um, 
spent some residency time with some Flint families documenting intimately what it, what it has been to live without, you know, running water and drink, drinkable water in Flint. And we're doing this on purpose. We know that the Flint um, lawsuit, the environmental lawsuit is going to be decided in the courts that are just some miles away from the museum, maybe this summer. And we want to make sure that we capture, you know, those kind of discussions um, and that we continue those discussions. This is going to be the most important um, environmental lawsuit in the history of the United States. And we wanna make sure that the museum is kind of like a platform for eliciting a lot of that civic dialogue that needs to take place to understand how, how we got there and how to avoid you know, getting there in the future. The last slide, if I may. Yeah, just some, some uh, activities of what we will have coming up for the anniversary year. But I wanted to bring to your attention the, the November event, which is on November 2nd, I believe it is, that when we officially open the Broad. And so in November 2nd, we actually want to make a party where we will invite you know, everyone in the community to come and celebrate with us who turns, you know, 10 year anniversaries or um, either someone's birthday. And so that will be fun to see, you know, who turns 10 on that day. And then we will be able to see uh, what that looks like, the passage of time uh, of, of 10 years in a human. But also if anyone has had like a 10 year anniversary, 10 year of being cancer free, 10 year of you know, being sober, any sort of important anniversary for the community, we want to celebrate on that day. And so these are just like a handful of, of strategies that we are um, implementing in the museum now to make sure that the community feels welcome, uh, to make sure the community feels acknowledged, and that we are addressing some of their pressing issues and that we leverage the campus and the community partners expertise in addressing those. Um, one other thing that right now in the, the museum, we have the two exhibitions that are of, of local interest as well. One is Interstates of the Mind. And again, all of this is you know art and contemporary art uh, in context of larger discussions. And so it's called Interstates of the Mind and it looks at the car culture in general, like the American ideal of connection, upward mobility um based on the car culture but we're also looking at it critically and it also has information from off-campus colleagues uh like from the historical society etc and uh we are keen on every single time we have an exhibition to make sure that there's something for families which is something that we were we we they were our focus but you know we did not present something to a family as soon as they walked into the museum so right now when you walk into the museum you you get offered a couple of brochures one exhibition is interstates of the mind the other one is seeds of resistance that talks about biodiversity both brochures have for example scavenger hunts for the children right so interstates of the mind you open the free brochure and it already has a scavenger hunt that you can activate with your family as you are visiting the museum and Seeds of the Mind also has a scavenger hunt for, for children and then other activities that you can develop at the museum in the education center or take them back home and continue your experience. So developing different strategies to make sure that we transform into a welcoming institution for our immediate communities. So that's kind of the pitch that I did to the search committee at MSU. Um, and so we're, we're starting to implement some of those, but that, that's the idea that we further the field of contemporary art, but we make sure we are paying attention to our immediate communities. So uh, please visit in February, in February, in the fall, and let us know how we're doing. We, we take a lot of surveys and a lot of feedback very seriously. So thank you for letting me come and talk with you all. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. We've been wanting to meet you for a long time, so I'm glad that that could finally happen. Thank you. Happy um, to can I just ask Monica? One Sorry. Your enthusiasm is so contagious. I, I feel like I want to run over to the Broad right now. Oh, <laughs> that makes me happy. Thank you. That you just made my day. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> um, could I ask a quick question really quick? Um, how do you feel like we can collaborate more in the future? Where, where do you feel the Art Commission fits in with the Broad's mission? And, you know, how do you... Um, we, this last, uh, to, to use as an example, this last display of the children's artwork, the elementary artwork that we just put up in the in the art lab. Um, so uh, Steph Cribb said that you had a um, a record attendance um, for for 
you know, people coming in to check out that artwork. I love that. I love people, right. you know, us utilize where we're, where we're both, um, we're taking our, what we come to the table with and, and blending them. And so we're not reinventing the wheel. So right. how do you foresee us working together in the future? But, you know, in, in yeah, I mean, exactly like that, you know, like, for example, there's uh, four different subject matter. I mean, I think that that any proposal, any partnership has to be a win win. Right. And I understand the discussion you had with other proposals like, you know, but I do think that with the arts, we all win, to be honest, and for us to be surprised and and like um, like Ben was saying, you know, sometimes art, when art is always different and, and sometimes it's not familiar and it stays with you because it sometimes it just needs, you need time to recognize something that you just had never seen before. So I think living in that environment of, um, of alert and recognition, you know, where you have to recognize things is, is a very good, it's where the creative spark um, happens. So to say similar, you know, similar partnerships as we've done in the past, but certainly what we want from East Lansing is this kind of visibility, you know, in the public sphere. We know that the as loud and bold as the broad building is, um, I think we could actually potentially double our attendance numbers to be, to be very transparent. And I think, um, it's a challenge for us to let folks know, and this is a challenge for every university museum, the, the, the lay person walking down the street is not really clear if that building is just for the campus community or also for the East Lansing community. And, you know, other university museums I've worked with, same thing, you know, this is campus, are we welcome? Because the, maybe the building next to it, which is our administrative offices, those are not for the, for the public, right? So how do, so we have that challenge um, and uh, we would like to help with overcoming that. Like, how do we get the message out there that the Broad is free and open to the public and it is our community, you know, it's contemporary art, but it's also uh, high quality art that, that serves us, the community. And so we might come to you for this kind of partnerships, you know, do you have a wall where we could do a mural? You know, we were looking for, a, um, and I think my colleague Stephen probably talked to some, some of you or he shared a newspaper article that is Lansing was looking for someone to paint a wall in, in a building so things like that you know can we can we bring the museum um, outside of the museum box and by the same token you know can we serve the community by bringing into the museum and enjoying of free programs of really high quality so there's some these themes that we want to do once a year this year it's going to be mass incarceration um, I just did this presentation today uh, next year um, it's going to be, oh, sh I threw it out. Well, we're, we're developing, um, well, next year is going to be the Frida Kahlo and clinical files. So can, you know, uh, with this kind of like health awareness, um, we are going to talk about food, food sovereignty and food justice in 2023. Um, in 2024, we're going to talk about sustainability and climate change. And for example, we want to make sure that everyone leaves a museum knowing you know, what is a carbon footprint? What does that mean? How can I help? Why should I be concerned about climate change and how this impacts me my, individually in my life? You know, so all of those um, stories can be addressed through, um, through the arts. Yeah, you're oh, okay. <laughs> I just got a text saying that my presentation was eh. so. Anyway, a lot of these, you know, big themes that, const that all of these can be unpacked in a very creative, fun, visually compelling way by artists. So climate change, um, food sovereignty, um, sports, and so and social justice is also something we want to address in 2024, etc. So what I can do is, you know, float those themes by you. See if there are some community partners that are already working in those same areas so that they can come and join us in our curatorial team, or they can develop their own projects in their own venues, uh, in their own voice for their own communities, but then we can cross promote and have like this sense of like, you like this mark, you like the farmer's market here. The museum is talking about food sovereignty and, and, and food injustice, you know, right now across the street. So this kind of sense of like citywide festivals, you know, these kind of themes that we, that can spill out from the museum. And I'd be happy to change some of those things, you know, with you. We would say like, you know, we want to do some big food festival, but it's not when you're doing the show. That's when I come in and say, well, I'll, I'll change my date. 
to okay. be able to, you know, support you all. And we can create this kind of like citywide kind of like sense of festivals. I think that would be interesting. That would be really interesting. Thank you. Monica, you're such an amazing breath of fresh air in terms of a voice coming out of the Broad and out of MSU. I'm really excited to get to work with you. It's going to be Thank amazing. You. Thank <laughs> you. Jeffrey. Likewise. Abigail, yes. Hi, Monica. I just wanted to say that I, um, at Heather's um, invitation, attended the Seeds of Resistance um, presentation, last, virtual presentation last night about art and activism and loved it. So thank you so much for bringing that to us. Oh, thank you. That was all my colleagues, Stephen Bridges. I'll, I'll share, I'll, I'll convey, but thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I actually had a conversation with Jenny Kendler the day of the opening of the exhibition and I was just blown away uh, that this is, you know, a very professional artist and the amount of science and research that she had done to, to create her work um, and but last night was it Claire Pentecost or was it Jenny Kendler? Jenny, right? Jenny, yeah, uh, yeah the, remarkable. I mean, it's always so much fun to to learn from the artists, and they really take their inspiration from absolutely every single aspect of the world. So you you tell me a theme, and I'll find you an artist that approaches that in a creative manner. So you know, we have a lot of fun, and we hope to share that informal education, but always fun and intriguing at the museum. So I'm glad you attended. Thank you. Amazing. Monica, thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank uh, you. I can't wait to partner with you all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll come with ideas. Don't worry. Don't worry. And uh, I, I do still need to explore the city. I have to be honest, but you know, as soon as it's possible, you, you will be hearing from me for sure. Don't, don't doubt okay. that. I know you, <laughs> you have more folks coming in, right? To give other presentations. We, we have a couple more, um, but commissioners, were there any other questions? I uh, excellent. Great. Thank you. Nice meeting you all. Hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, next we have the Dr. Green recognition. Um, so I don't know if we can go ahead and let Alina into the room. Or Elaine, sorry. Hi, here I am. How are you? Good, welcome oh, back. So um, I am excited about the Broad, right? Um, wasn't that was amazing? I um, mean, I'm really happy to report that the Dr. King Commission um, actually has a partnership with the Broad Art Lab. Um, we do an annual art contest um, for kids in grades K through 12, and then we do an open call for adults, and um, it is going to be on. Um, exhibit 25 pieces of art that we um, juried and selected will be on exhibit at the Broad Art Lab beginning April 4th. So I hope that if you have an opportunity that you go over and take a look at that artwork. Awesome. But I'm not here to talk, but I'm not here to talk about that. <laughs> I am, I'm here to um, talk about um, a project that I am um, immensely um, honored to be able to work um, with and on. And it is um, just something that we're in calling the Robert L. Green Project. And um, so I want to kind of share with you um, what the committee is doing and to, um, to hopefully um, get you excited about the project and hopefully you'll agree to, um, to, to support it. So Liam, you can, you can begin sharing. And, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm sorry, I'm Elaine Hardy. In, in my real day job, I'm the diversity, equity, and inclusion administrator for the city of East Lansing. <clears throat> and I also serve as the liaison for the city of East Lansing to the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Commission of Mid Michigan. Um, so the Robert L. Green Project, really our hope is to um, tell Dr. Green's personal story of integrating East Lansing. And this is a picture of Dr. Green with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I think around 1963, um, when, when uh, I believe this was Dr. King's first visit to the MSU campus. Um, you can go ahead and change the slide. And so for those of you who may not be familiar with Dr. Dr. Green, um, while he is a nationally known um, 
civil rights leader um, and an, actually a nationally known educator. Um, he has a very strong connection to, to East Lansing and to the MSU community. He was um, recruited to come here um, by John Hanna to um, formulate and head up then the um, Department of Urban Planning. He and his family were the first family to integrate East Lansing and to integrate Pinecrest Elementary School. He served as the National Education Director for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And this last thing, um, every time I have an opportunity to talk about it, I have to let it sit with me for a while because of the significance of it for our community. Uh, Dr. King, I'm sorry, Dr. Green um, um, had a landmark uh, civil rights victory um, in 1963 um, after uh, John F. Kennedy signed an executive order banning housing discrimination. Um, you can go ahead and change that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Why I'm here today is to talk about the Robert L. Green Project. And what this project we hope will do was is that it will memorialize the civil rights achievement of Dr. Green, to memorialize East Lansing civil rights history and educate the community on the numerous civil rights activities organized and supported by Dr. Green while he was in East Lansing. We can go to the next slide. So, um, one of the things that we are hopeful of doing and what we actually are working on as a committee is to do um, a series of things. One is to um, erect a state marker on Bessemer Street on the parkland across from the home that will talk about the history of redlining um, as well as Dr. Green's landmark civil rights victory. Um, and then to name a school. And we actually visited our, our neighbors in Pinecrest the, um, earlier this week to talk about our hopes in renaming Pinecrest School in honor of Dr. Green. And then later on, as we are still working on this process to get the home designated as a, a, as a national historic site. So that's what the project encapsulates. Um, a state historic marker, the um, renaming of the school, and having the home designated as a national place of historic, of historic importance. So you can go ahead and change the slide, Leo. So when I talk about the landmark civil rights victory, and I mentioned President Kennedy, um, in November of 1962, President Kennedy signed an executive order. And that executive order is, um, it banned housing discrimination in, in the country. Um, the day after um, President Kennedy signed, Kennedy signed that executive order, Dr. Robert Green, who was a who lived in East Lansing at the time, um, filed suit against the Lansing Board of Realtors because they would not permit him to purchase a home in East Lansing. Um, he was Dr. Green was the first person in the United States to use this executive order, challenging housing discrimination in the United States, and prevailed. So that makes East Lansing the first city in the nation to test this executive order that banned housing discrimination. So when you think about East Lansing um, and this um, landmark um, victory that he won, it makes East Lansing have some very national significance in terms of how we um, dealt with housing discrimination and particularly issues of redlining. So any of you who may know um, or heard of Dr. Green, he talks about the story of you know, how he and his wife um, wanted to buy a home and they want, he wanted to live in East Lansing and realtors routinely directed him to South Lansing. And he um, really got tired of it and had a conversation with um, President Hanna and said, listen, you know, I'm a faculty member and I cannot buy a home in East Lansing. And so they were trying to do several things to kind of backdoor this purchase. There were um, people, white people in the community that said, oh, we'll buy the house and we'll just sell it to you. Well, the covenants in some homes uh, obviously prevented that from happening. Um, but Dr. Green said, no, I want to purchase the home. And so that is in fact what happened. He was able to, once this um, executive order was signed by Kennedy, he was able to sue 
the Lansing um, Board of Realtors and he was able to purchase the home at 207 Bessemer Drive. You can change the slide. So what ended up happening is that um, he purchased the first home in East Lansing by a black person, um, Dr. Green did. Um, he was the first um, um, person, as I said, in, um, in the nation to test the executive order by um, Kennedy. And then more significantly, um, the house at 207 Bessemer became a war room for strategizing and advancing civil rights in East Lansing. As a matter of fact, he had the conversation with John Hanna um, and um, the mayor of the city of East Lansing at that time to start this um, um, commission called the Human Relations Commission, now the Human Rights Commission, in the home on 207 Bessemer. He also strategized with the football players um, to um, organize a um, threatened strike against the NCAA if they did not have um, Black officials. And so there's just a list of things that happened at the home on 207 Bessemer. Bessemer. Coretta Scott King um, um, stayed at that home and visited that home with him while she was in East Lansing. She actually spoke at the East Lansing Hannah Community Center, um, it was Hannah Middle School then. Um, and then the last thing that I want to um, say, remind the community about also is that Dr. Green's children then in turn integrated Pinecrest Elementary School. So it was a lot of um, significant things that were happening um, during that time with um, Dr. Green and his family, but he always had an eye toward fairness. And the reason why he didn't allow any of his white friends, Mr. John Dewey or Mr. Hannah, or any of his other friends to purchase a home because he said, I'm a black faculty member. And if I don't buy a home, if I'm not allowed to buy a home, the next black faculty member won't be able to as well. And so he, he went out and decided that he was going to um, continue until he prevailed and he ended up buying the home on Bessemer. You can change the next slide. Oh, you, I think you went too far. Can go ahead. So I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the project timeline. So we began um, having this discussion more than, more than a year ago, but we formed a small committee um, in October to start kind of brainstorming how we might approach bringing this to the community. Um, and we did that in October. Um, right now we're in the process of um, preparing our state application so that we can um, house the state historic marker on parkland um, on Bessemer Drive. We're also right now getting community input, which is the reason why I'm here today, um, to hear what your thoughts are, um, and then to see if there's other ways that we might partner. Um, and then we're looking at um, a pro, um, submitting our application to the um, um, to the national, um, the name escapes me, it, we're looking at um, um, our application to make the site a National Historic Place in January, but that won't come into fruition for probably nine months or, or a year if it's approved. Um, and then we're looking at doing some dedications in August of 2021. So the dedications that we're looking, that we're pretty comfortable about doing is, is the, the parkland dedication of the historic marker that will not just talk about um, um, Robert Green, but we'll talk about the history of redlining and housing discrimination in East Lansing and use um, Dr. Green as the, um, as, the, as the case for that. And our hope also at that time would be to have um, the community support the renaming of Pinecrest Element Elementary School to the Robert L. Green Elementary School. And you can go to the next slide. And these are just some of the partners that we are currently, uh, who have signed on to be sponsors or people who have agreed to support the project. And then I think this last slide just names the individuals who are on the committee there. And that's Adam DeLay from the East Lansing De um, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Ron Bacon um, from the East Lansing City Council and the East Lansing Education Foundation, Karen Honey, who is a um, HRC commissioner and resident and myself. And I think that that's all the slides I have, but I would love to answer questions if you have them. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. I got a little emotional being a homeowner in East Lansing. Um, <laughs> so that amazing, that was wonderful on a personal note. Thank you um, just for sharing that with us. Commissioners, did you 
Have questions, Abby? Okay, so not questions, but um, excitement. Um, I heard, uh, I, I watched the presentation that you made to the HRC. And then also, obviously, I was at the presentation you made on Monday to the Pinecrest um, Neighborhood Association. But after the HRC presentation, um, during that, Adam DeLay spoke about specifically the, the kind of um, marker they're hoping to put across the street from the home and that Parks and Rec was on board with helping with some landscaping around the marker and that sort of stuff um, to make things more special. And I immediately was like, we should commission a sculpture. We should, you know, um, and I was like, oh, we just put out this RFQ for this giant mural that'll be downtown. Um, the, you know, our, the description of it already says that, you know, we wanna focus on issues of diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, but I wonder if it, I reached out to Heather and said, could we get even more specific now? Is it possible or is it too late in the process to say we specifically want this mural to help with telling this story of these landmark civil rights issues that happened right here in East Lansing? And um, uh, so I was just wondering if the committee had any reaction to that or um, any thoughts on how we could best serve the committee um, and maybe uh, boost it with our arts, whatever arts resources we have available. Uh, commissioners, thoughts, Wendy? Or Karen, I'm sorry. I was looking at Wendy. <laughs> you, you can call me Wendy. Um, <laughs> I, uh, first of all, thank you, Elaine, for heading this up. I mean, I thought I knew about Dr. Green, but I did not know about his being the immediate case out the gate following the executive order from Kennedy. I mean, it, it's emotional and educational. So thank you very much for uh, bringing this forward. And Abby, I, I love the idea of trying to direct the mural towards this issue, if we can do that. I think that's a great idea. I agree. I think that's, I think that's smart, you know, um, even though the timeline might not sync with, you know, how it was, how it had already sort of gained some momentum. There's no reason why we can't um, change it. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea. Uh, it's a smart idea. And um, we should seriously consider that. Heather? Yeah, I was gonna say, so the art selection panel is meeting on April 4th or 5th, I can't remember now, but um, if this is the direction that you want to focus the mural, more specifically focus the mural on, then I would communicate that with the artists that they choose in the April 5th meeting and move it forward. I don't think it's something we need to vote on because the the goal of the mural is already pretty similar. We're just putting a, an actual live face to it um, and real stories, so real history. Um, so I don't think it would be too, unless there's a strong opposition to it, it would not be difficult. And it, it matches up with the timeline because you're deciding it before the art selection panel selects the artists, so. Um, maybe we could do a, a informal um, gauge of interest uh, in shifting the focus. Jesse? Can I just ask a quick question? I can't remember from my reading of the RFQ. Heather, there's a, it's a, there's a possibility that multiple artists would be selected to move proposals forward after the RFQ meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're, they're going to pick three or four artists just based on their qualifications and um, they each get $500 to develop an actual specific mural for our space. So I would be communicating with them regardless of, of a more focused um, image. So. I guess I was wondering, Elaine, um, I don't want to impose any extra duties on you, but it, it seems like it would be helpful if we're asking artists to develop a, um, a mural that, that speaks to East Lansing's history and East Lansing's diversity, 
seems like you are the person that has the greatest knowledge of the different historical landmarks on East Lansing. I was wondering if you might be able to um, either prepare like a little portfolio for the artists that are chosen or meet with them to kind of point them in certain directions to inspire their um, final design. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Okay. To just to clarify what it if it were written, would it be written that it would be the main focus or part of like an element of the greater mural? Just I want to make sure we're making that clear. I, it, it would be more verbal than written, but I can write out like a little paragraph of how I'm interpreting your request and just email it to you um, and then reply just to me. <laughs> but um, what I'm, what I'm imagining or what I'm uh, interpreting you to say is that you would like the mural to not just focus on the diversity of the community and the nation, you want it to focus more specifically on the historical um, significance of East Lansing within the uh, civil rights movement. Is that relatively accurate. <laughs> Are you asking me or Elaine? Anybody, the, oh. <laughs> everybody, the, the focus of the mural, anybody who has an opinion on it. <laughs> well, I guess my, uh, my question that I was going to ask was to Elaine as a representative of the committee is, is to just mention, is this something that the committee would be interested in working with the Arts Commission and Arts Selection Panel on? So I, I, I can speak for myself as a member of the committee and say, I, I, can't, I can't imagine why we wouldn't, right? And of course I would be excited to. And, and just so that you know, we're clear, there's a really significant milestones in terms of social justice um, and um, 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 civil rights um, aside from the um, work that Dr. Green did. I mean, East Lansing was the first city, I believe, in the nation that um, made, um, that put um, LGBTQ rights on its city as an ordinance. So they, they last year passed a, 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 an, an ordinance weapon um, that made it a crime to weapon, weaponize police against black and brown people. So there are, there are several kind of touch points to get to um, Ali's um, point about you know, what a diversity mural could look like. You know, it could certainly focus on kind of breaking those um, redlining um, and housing discriminatory practices, but they're, they're just other kind of uh, landmarks that we could highlight that are positive, right? That, um, that are also positive, so yes. Well, I think whichever direction, it all sounds very exciting. So yeah, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that we were all on the same page, whether it was like completely focused or looking at the slightly bigger history, but I think both sound really neat. Cool. Yeah, that's a cool idea to sort of put together a like, <laughs> again, when the, and if we can help Elaine in any way to put a packet together to give to the the qualified artists that go through to sort of be like here is your inspiration and we're still we're still developing kind of what the um the the parkland area will look like how big it will be right we've got to we've got to figure that out we know that we're going to put the the largest state marker that that's available there because we really want to dedicate both sides of it to um telling the accurate history of, of redlining and what that meant to um, to this community and really to, to highlight the, the, um, the integration of the elementary school in the neighborhood. So there still could be an opportunity, Abby, to put that sculpture there. <laughs> cool. Do the mural, then we'll do the sculpture. <laughs> um, awesome, I think that that would be a really awesome look for us. Um, Timeline-wise, Heather, when would we need to make a decision about that or sorry uh, um, specifically the mural the sculpture yeah the sculpture the mural the mural well both actually but yeah oh um i would say by the april 5th uh Deadline. 
April 5th uh, meeting that the art selection panel is choosing the artists. So it's, not, it, and like I said, I don't think it needs a formal vote. It just needs like a, yeah, we're on board kind of thing. <laughs> so, cool. and then, yeah. Oh. So maybe we can really quickly, and then we'll move on to the sculpture section, but uh, maybe we can really quickly just take a little gauge of interest um, if people feel uh, comfortable moving the mural into awesome things that East Lansing has done in terms of civil rights. You know, give a thumbs up. Um, all right, we have interest. Uh, <laughs> we would like to see that. Um, great. Um, and then in terms of the sculpture, what would be the timeline, Heather, on that? I think I would I would bow to Elaine and what her timeline ends up being for the parkland, um, how much space they're able to have, because it could be something that we add later once they already have their stuff in the ground and the whatever, it, whatever they decide to do, how much landscaping, et cetera, we can always add a sculpture or likely add a sculpture in this case. So, And, and our hope um, is to have the um, state designation approved in June um, so that we can install the marker for an August dedication. Um, and we are hoping that we would get the approval of the um, school board and hopefully the support from the community to rename the school around that same time for in August. So our timeline is pretty quick and that's August of this year. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that as Heather um, said that that would preclude you from doing something later, um, you know, commissioning a work later to put on that parkland. Um, we don't, again, we don't know what that footprint looks like um, right now, but we, we have had conversations about it being big enough for us to put the marker in a bench and some landscaping. So, I mean, there, there may be some, we certainly are open to having other conversations because I think it's a great idea too. One more thought on the a potential sculpture. Um, would it have to just be there? Like if the school is renamed, could we put it on the school property? I, I mean, I know that's different property, but where the story could have a greater impact because kids see it every day and make that connection that that was a real person and not just like, you know, I went to a school called Scott School. I didn't know who that was, you know? So like pulling the story forward more. So I, I'm support in support of that idea, but you know, that would be a decision for the school board, right? So yeah. they would have to make a decision about whether, you know, they would want to have that, but. It might be I a longer term plan. <laughs> they have been really great to listen to um, this project and to, um, kind of be really ready to hear what the community thinks of it. And I, and I, I'm really, um, I'm getting, I get kind of emotional because for, you know, for the one or two naysayers that we have had with regard to this project, there's just been such overwhelming interest and in support from the community to do it. I mean, it's, you know, um, it, it, and it's, and it, and it, and it makes you hopeful, right? Um, so I'm, I'm excited that the community is excited about the project and I'm hoping that as we continue to talk to more groups and to talk to more community members that there'll just be a groundswell of folks and say, yes, yeah, yeah, let's do this, so. Cool. Um, uh, any other questions for Elaine? Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything else for us? No, I just, you know, I, I, I'd love to hear, you know, your thoughts. If you want to email me or, you know, um, you know, if, if you're willing to sign a petition or do any of those things, if we, if we, if we, if we ever, if we feel like we have need of it, I think it might be great to show the school board that there are community members who are in support of this. But if you, you know, have questions or are supportive of it, if you want to just email me and let me know offline, that would be great. We, I would appreciate it. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, we are, I uh, know that we're after seven o'clock. We're having so many amazing conversations, um, but uh, just bear with me for a moment um, uh, as we go to the next uh, item on our agenda, um, which is the uh, cultural arts grant review. Um, Heather, is it best for you to walk us through this or? I can do that, yep. Um, so 
there's a bug. Um, <laughs> uh, at the February meeting, I believe Abby again <laughs> brought up that uh, we would like to review and refine the cultural arts grant process and guidelines uh, to better reflect the commission's goals and um, just pretty much change it. <laughs> uh, there's always been complaints even before all of you were on the commission every year, there's always something else. And so it's kind of a, can we just take care of this finally kind of situation. Um, so I did some research and um, cause Abby's suggestion was that we form a committee. So I wanted to make sure that you all knew what that entailed and give you a couple options. Obviously this is not the be all end all to how you could handle business, but these are just a couple options that I um, wanted to give you. So you can form a committee. And if you decide to do that, you can do that tonight. Um, Laura would just ask for members to nominate themselves or each other. Um, and my recommendation is that if you do that, that you set some parameters for yourself, that you have a certain number of meetings, a certain number of individuals, and um, that you, I would follow up with you and we would organize dates pretty quickly and then have a specific time that we would be getting back to the commission with your recommendation because it would need final approval by the full commission. Uh, because we are all on Zoom these days, a committee meeting is a little more involved than a committee meeting would be if we were not on Zoom, but it's much the same as the Arts Commission. So you would still need to have an open meeting so uh, closed captioning and anybody from the public. So posting and notifying the public that uh, there's a meeting. And then, so Liam staff time, my staff time and the um, biotech person's staff time. So that's an option, but I wanted to make sure you knew all of the information that went along with choosing that option. The other option is that uh, your next couple agendas are pretty empty at this point. There may be one um, developer coming forward with an art proposal in the next two months, but that's all I've caught wind of. Um, so you could dedicate an entire meeting to discussing the cultural arts grant. That would give you your two hours or we could book longer for Viatech um, and revise it from the ground up, uh, but during a regularly scheduled arts commission meeting. So either is totally fine um, and I'll leave it up to you. And I did include the cultural arts grant application and guidelines in this just so whichever decision you made, you did have those in front of you moving forward for the next step. Um, Heather, can I ask a um, question? Mm -hmm. um, is this something where we possibly could center, if we did decide to do a commit, a subcommittee, is this possibly something we could center as the, the committee is gonna meet three times the half hour before the Arts Commission meeting? Is that a possibility? You could do that. Um, I don't think that, I'd have to make sure that there's nothing else scheduled right before you, but I don't think there is. Um, I think usually there's one other meeting scheduled on Thursdays and I think it's in the morning. Okay. But yes, it could be same night, earlier time. Um, the time would is really up to the group. The more specific, the the parts that you aren't able to actually make the decisions about are the closed captioning, open meeting, etc. So, would that relieve any of the burden on staff if it if we if it was before this meeting? in terms of scheduling captioning and all. I know we would still have to pay for the, the captioning and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it would still be the same staff time, I would think. Um, and I, I think it's really, it doesn't matter either or if it's at a different time, 
an hour before or whatever. So I do think that if you decided to make it bef right before your arts commission meeting, you would still want a bit of a gap between like maybe at least 15 minutes so that, um, so that like Liam can transition into the other meeting. We can open that up and make sure that anybody from the public has a chance to log in before your meeting and everything, so. Great. Um, Yes, Carrie. Had to get off mute. Um, I have a thought. So I've been on the Arts Commission for a few years now. This is my fourth year. And I have some, I have some thoughts about our cultural arts program because I've been through it several times. But the, the thing that, that I know about our commission now is that we have a lot of new members who haven't been through it, who might have some fresh ideas. So my suggestion would be that we give it a stab as at a, at a commission meeting and just see where we, where we land. And if after dedicating some time during a meeting, we are spinning our wheels and we need to dig down a little deeper with just a few people, then we could think about setting up a, a subcommittee. Just a thought. I think that sounds great, Abby. Two. And I'm sorry, Allie and then Abby, or? Go ahead, Allie. Oh, okay. Um, well, two things. Yeah, I do think it's a great idea, obviously, to take time to brainstorm first, like going through individually. Um, but also, so as a new member, I don't have a ton of context on what the pain points were. Can anyone uh, really quickly summarize kind of where this, uh, where this conversation came from, what was causing the pain? Or is that too complicated? To no, say? I think that's a great idea. Let me go to um, Abby real quick. And then yes, let's let's talk about that moment. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to mostly basically uh, agree with Karen that, and uh, thank you, Heather, for uh, your memo on that. Um, it does seem like a heavy lift to form a subcommittee. And I think it would be great if maybe just ongoing, because we have some time before this all rounds up and starts again, if we say, okay, we're going to dedicate a 20 minute chunk and we get through whatever 20 minutes we can. And then we say, okay, that's that. It's just so it doesn't start taking up entire meetings. <laughs> I hope it would never get that point, but, and that we can just sort of together as a commission at regular commission meetings, work our way through it and try to make some improvements for next, the next round. Great. Um, Karen or Jesse, did you want to talk about the application? I could talk about my pain points. So what happens is we have a chunk of money that we grant out and pretty much every year we get the same applicants. Many times they submit documents, supporting documents that they submitted already five years ago and they just keep submitting the same ones over and over again. And we give the money to the same people every year. There you go. <laughs> That's how I see it. Jesse, what about helpful. you? <laughs> Because I've only been through that one time when we did that last month. Yeah. So, okay. I think um, I'll add a little bit of historical context to what Karen just said. I think so. Um, city support of the city sponsored festivals used to come from the general fund as part of the um, city council's budget process. This was like before my time and before my time on Arts Commission. So, anecdotally, this is what I've been told. And at some point the city council said, just like, hey, you know what, we, we know we wanna spend X amount of dollars on art, let's just give it to the arts commission and they can sort it out, right? Um, and so it really, you know, the fact that like the arts commission, the jazz fest or the arts festival, the jazz festival, the film festival come forward with their, ex or, you know, with their um, budget request is not, it, that's kind of always been part of the process. So I don't necessarily think that we're gonna um, see that go away. But I think also what we've seen as just the variety of types of applicants has changed and um, evolved over the years. We also see that there's an expanded need for this type of sponsorship of community-centered, community-focused art, right? Um, and then I don't know what the budget was to start with. It was 10,000 when I joined the Arts Commission. Um, we had a very a uh, fierce advocate in Aaron Stevens as the council liaison at that point who really pushed through uh, a pretty considerable budget increase for that pool of money. It went from 10 to like 17. You know, so we got a nice uh, chunk of um, extra money that we could allocate. 
And really, I think actually um, the commission itself sort of started actively recruiting people and kind of um, trying to make sure that the um, information about those grants being available got out to more people so that we would see more community um, things. And so I think there's some things in the budget or in the application the one that's coming to mind is that 15% requirement. Um, and so that's really, um, I, for new commissioners, there's a requirement in the application as it stands right now that our part of your budget cannot be more than 15% of your total budget. And so that's, you know, and that's appropriate when you're talking about things that are the scale of the arts festival and the scale of the jazz festival and the film festival, but it's not particularly appropriate when you're talking about things that are maybe one time experiences, um, the art, you know, the art and uh, community engagement things that the library has been getting in, the mobile Black History of the Month um, museums and things like that. The whole budget for the whole project is very small. And so limiting our portion of it to 15% sometimes, you know, like essentially makes it pointless for people to apply. And those are things that we actually really would like to see supported. And I think um, I, I don't know how this commission um, feels about it, but the commission that I served on was interested in kind of fostering community events that were driven, you know, by one or two individuals and were, were much more kind of experiential. Um, and essentially, you know, I think I'm thinking about like um, the community darkroom that was happening at the high school, you know, we gave them like $300 or something and they, that was enough to fill out their whole program to make a, you know, a really lasting um, program that is ongoing and growing and engaging you know more community members and now they're starting to um, host art exhibitions of their students work and things like that so um, I think that's the that's the one part that I'd really like to see changed is that 15 percent I think that is no longer really applicable um, in terms of the budget, you know, I, my feeling is let's give away all the money that we have and prove that there's a demand for more, right? So if we, I think the two years that we've had that slightly increased budget, the first year we were able to fully fund pretty much everything. Um, I think there was a few asks that got like slightly decreased because we didn't have like exactly the amount of money and we, you know, we adjusted their budget by a couple tens of dollars. Um, and then this this year, of course, COVID is. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna judge anything as normal by this year because <laughs> there was nothing normal. Like obviously, we did not see a lot of asks for big community um, outreach engagement projects because people were actively not engaging in large community projects, right? So, um, you know, so we'll probably probably have that same seventeen thousand next year. I don't know. We're about to join into the budget process. You know, I'll push for twenty just because it's a nice round number, and why not? And we'll see if we can give it away. Um, but I think if we have a couple of years where we can show that the demand is greater than our budget, then you know there's that chance to go out and ask for more. So I think making sure that the application is really accessible to the types of projects that we really want to see driven in the community is probably the best way to focus that discussion. Um, and know that you're still probably going to see those asks from the art festival and from the city festivals just because those asks are no longer built into the municipal budget project. So, um, you know, those will still be part of it, probably. Um, I don't know if that was helpful. <laughs> okay, that helps a lot. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Abby? And then one other pain point that's been brought up in previous meetings, and I think um, largely by Megan Holland, former commissioner, um, the, and Jesse sort of touched on it in terms of accessibility, but it's accessibility in terms of how the guidelines are set up and how the grant has to be submitted. Um, I guess, especially just because having been now through my first round, so many applications where it was like, I, we just need this information presented in a different, better way. And I know Heather did a lot to try to reach out and, um, you know, uh, give uh, presentations to sort of help like uh, applicants understand and that sort of stuff. But I just, I think it deserves a more ex exploration as to how we might reformat the guidelines so that it's accessible in terms of like, if you're someone who writes grants all the time, that's, this application is simple. But if you've never done that before, if you're really not used to this, if you're a new community entity trying to build something that we make sure we get to them too and that they can submit a solid proposal for those funds. 
Awesome. So I think that what uh, Karen suggested um, and also piggybacking on what um, Abby suggested sounded like the best course might be for us to dedicate um, our next meeting, if it looks light, um, to this and talking about it and throwing around ideas. Um, and then I do like to let's see where we're at. And if it makes sense to do a subcommittee, then we can go ahead and do so. Or if it makes more sense to dedicate a portion of our meeting um, ongoing, that has been a useful strategy for us in the past um, <laughs> to, to dedicate an amount of time and just cut it off um, so that we, we can get uh, talking through that. So does anyone have strong, does anyone have strong feelings for not talking about, or does anyone have strong feelings about setting up an independent committee or a committee now rather than talking about it as a group? No? Okay. Um, then why don't we look at dedicating the majority of next uh, month's meeting to this? Um, and then we'll set a, a course of action going forward once we realize what's on the table. Great. Um, anything else about this? Thank you so much, Abby, for bringing this to our attention. <clears throat> um, as we go back. Uh, so uh, our recap's really short today um, because we're going to talk about uh, the cultural arts grants uh, in our next meeting. Um, and then just really excited about um, potential with uh, Dr. Green um, sculpture, uh, potential with the mural, with the mural um, uh, direction, um, and also with Ben's uh, potential collaboration. Um, so we'll, we'll touch base on these things as we go. Anything else for the group for the meeting? No? I just wanted to say it's really exciting. This was, I mean, I feel like, I feel like this commission is taking on some really substantial um, stuff. I love it. I'm really, really excited actually. Go get them guys. Yeah. <laughs> get that art. Get it. I love it. I love it, all of it. Um, all right, well, if there is nothing else for the rest of the meeting, um, I would uh, like to see if anyone would like to motion to adjourn. Wendy, all right, anyone second? All right, Ben, uh, thank you so much. Can we have a vote? All those in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. All those opposed? All right, so moved. We're adjourned. Watch the basketball game tonight. We'll see you next.